Okay, so we've now got a nice uh, question on equilibrium uh, using sulfur, uh, made to sulfur trioxide. So it says, use, Le Chatelier's principle can be used to predict how different conditions affect equilibrium position. Use Le Chatelier's principle to show that a low temperature and a high pressure should obtain the maximum equilibrium yield of sulfur trioxide. So let's do that first. So the first thing to notice is this is an exothermic reaction. It's a minus, a negative number. So it's exothermic. So the forward reaction is exothermic. And that means the backward reaction is endothermic. So when I decrease the temperature, the equilibrium moves in the exothermic direction to increase the temperature. So that's why I'd use a low temperature for this reaction to encourage the reaction to move in the exothermic direction, the forward reaction. Why do I want to use a high pressure? Well, let's have a look. I've got three moles of gas here, but only two moles of gas there. So remember, if I increase the pressure, the reaction tries to decrease the pressure, which will move it to the side with the fewest number of gas moles. And that's on the uh, right hand side towards the products. So an increase in pressure, pushes the equilibrium to the right-hand side. Now, why may we not use those uh, reaction conditions in uh, real life? Well, if I've got a low temperature, it means that the rate is very, very slow. So a low temperature, good equilibrium yield, but very, very slow rate. So I have to find a compromise between the two. It's no point having to wait 200 years to reach that equilibrium position. The other thing is why may I not want to use a high pressure is because it's expensive to maintain a high pressure um, and also for safety reasons as well. Um, so for those two reasons, that may be why I don't want to have a high pressure. In terms of rate, high pressure is great because rate increases with pressure. So high pressure is great for rate, great for equilibrium, but not so good in terms of cost and also in terms of safety. Okay, so we're now going to start putting some numbers into our equilibrium uh, now. So it's given me the equilibrium concentration of sulfur dioxide and also oxygen. And it's also given me Kc, which is 0 0.160. Um, so using the value of Kc, explain whether the equilibrium position will be towards the right or towards the left under these conditions. Well, as we know, Kc is equal to the concentration of the products, which is SO3, and that's squared, over the concentration of the reactant, which is SO2 squared, and then O2 plus. So, so it's quite small, isn't it? Kc is less than one, which means this figure must be bigger than that figure, which means the equilibrium is towards the left-hand side, it's towards the reactants, because I've got more of this than that, because Kc is less than one. Right, so let's pop some numbers into this now. Kc, they told me, is 0 0.160. They want me to find the uh, concentration of SO3, so I don't know that. But I do know the concentration of SO2, which is uh, 2. And I do know the concentration of oxygen, which is 1.2, like so. Right, um, this here uh, will come to 4.8. So, and you rearrange it to give you 0 0.160 times 4.8 is equal to the concentration of SO3 squared. Um, so this comes to 0 0.768 and therefore the concentration of SO3 is equal to 0 0.876 moles per decimeter cubed. Um, you must remember to keep all of these as square brackets throughout because square bracket means concentration. So don't change it to uh, curvy, arrow, curvy brackets. Keep them as square brackets throughout. Okay, and now we get into some good old fashioned organic chemistry. So first of all, name the homologous series that this, uh, uh, this is a member of. Well, of course, it's an alkene, isn't it? You've got a double bond there, pretty, pretty simple. 
What's the general formula? Well, we know the general formula for an alkene is CnH2n. So that's okay. What reagents and conditions are needed to convert compound B into a saturated hydrocarbon? If I'm making it saturated, I'm getting rid of that double bond. So I would be using hydrogen with a nickel catalyst. Um, right, and now we have got a flow chart and they want me to put some reactants in. So I don't know what I start with, but I do know that if I use potassium dichromate and sulfuric acid, there's no reaction. Remember, potassium dichromate and sulfuric acid that uh, would normally oxidize an alcohol, or perhaps an aldehyde, um, there's no reaction. So uh, perhaps I'm looking at a tertiary alcohol, maybe? Um, could be. Uh, concentrated sulfuric acid. Concentrated sulfuric acid, if you think to your uh, synthesis, concentrated sulfuric acid dehydrates an alcohol to give me an alkene. Whoa, okay, so it looks like I'm starting with a tertiary alcohol. So, the tertiary alcohol, I'm going to draw what I've got here, but without the double bond. And I know the OH has got to go on this carbon because then that makes it a tertiary alcohol, which means that goes to the H. And if you remove those two with concentrated sulfuric acid, I get that. Polymerization, well, remember, polymerization, draw this as an H shape, like so. CH3, CH3. Nice bonds going on, square brackets, and then an N at the bottom right hand side. Right, so we're into the final page now of the paper and it wants me to calculate uh, or work out an empirical formula. So you count up your atoms, you should see that you have got four carbons there, you have got 10 hydrogens and you have got two oxygens um, and you can simplify that down into C2H5O. Um, if you've done that then just cross through your answer so the examiner knows to ignore it. So C2 H5O. Right, now this is quite tricky. Student plans a two-stage synthesis for preparing F from B. So how can I do that? Well, I've got a double bond, so just think through double bond. What can you react a double bond with? Hydrogen? Or you're just going to make an alkane? That's not going to help you. Um, you've got to get to the stage where you have effectively added an OH onto each carbon because this bit of the molecule, if we go back, if I just highlight that bit is there and that bit is there. So I've just added OH onto each carbon. So go back to your alcohol chemistry now. How can you get an OH? Well, you can get an OH by reacting the halogen or alkane with um, sodium hydroxide in water. So how do you get, uh, so that means I've got to get a um, halogen uh, compound. Well, you'd start with perhaps bromine. So the first thing, stage one, is you react this with Br2. And you react it with Br2 and onto each carbon, you would add a bromine atom. The good old test for a carbon carbon double bond. And then you've got to replace those bromines with the OH. So, how do you do that? You would add sodium hydroxide solution, like so. And that's all there is to it. What may freak you out is you've got two OHs. If they only did one, you'd probably be okay. So just focus, if that's confusing you, just focus on how to get one and then think about how to get two because you may get some marks um, by getting at least one of them on rather than two. Okay.